Hello, uh, my name is Ian Todd from BBC Sky Night magazine, uh, and I'm here at the Blue Dot Festival 2022 at uh, Jodrell Bank in uh, Cheshire. Uh, and I'm um, joined today uh, in this lovely uh, outdoor decking uh, overlooking the, the Lovell, Lovell telescope there in the background by uh, Jim Wild, who's a professor um, of space physics at Lancaster University. Uh, Jim, thanks very much for, for speaking welcome. to me today. You're welcome. Um, you're, you're at Blue Dot today, um, you know, telling people about space weather and um, a bit, little bit about solar science. Um, do you, are, are you enjoying the festival so far? Do you get, do you get much chance to sort of mingle and actually, actually soak up the, soak up the atmosphere and, and enjoy it for a festival? Yeah, it's, it's really good. I love this festival. It's just a nice size, really family friendly. So I've got two little ones. So I usually come for the weekend, soak up the festival, uh, come around with the kids, do all the fun, the twilight parades and, and all that kind of stuff. Go to some of the other talks. Uh, myself and my daughter went and watched Tim Pete yesterday. So it's really great. Um, so this year I'm actually speaking on the Sunday, which is the last day of the festival, which is uh, new challenges for me. You end up being a bit disheveled by day three of any festival. <laughs> but uh, but no, it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant festival. And it's just great to come and, and be here. Do you, do you camp? <laughs> yeah, we're camping. I must admit, this year we're very lucky. We've got the old, we've got the little badges. We're in the uh, the artist campsite, so um, so it's it's really great. Uh, so we're uh, over there in the tent, and I've been for for two nights now. So nice one, but you're managing to keep it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good so far. All good. Um, so let's let's um, start off at, at, at the basics, I guess. What what is space weather? Great question. So, so the way I try and describe it is that space weather is the way that the environment around the Earth changes from minute to minute and hour to hour, driven by solar activity. So that's uh, electromagnetic activity, material leaving the sun, radiation leaving the sun, interacting with the Earth's atmosphere, uh, interacting with the Earth's magnetic field, and also, crucially nowadays, interacting with technology on the Earth's surface, beneath the Earth's surface, and in orbit around the Earth. Okay, so what sort of... Um what 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 are the sort of consequences of of space weather that we can measure and, and observe? Okay, so we, we've really been observing space weather effects now for well about 150 years actually. So so um, if we go back and look through through the history books, we realise in in, uh, in 1859 there was an enormous space weather event which uh, released a huge coronal mass ejection. So that's an explosion of solar plasma being fired out from the sun, about say a billion tonnes of the outer atmosphere being fired out at a million miles an hour towards the Earth. And when that arrived at the Earth, it triggered a massive geomagnetic storm. And when I say massive, I mean huge. So big that the northern lights were being observed by ship's captains in the Caribbean. The northern lights were out over San Francisco for three nights running. But crucially, that was a time where it was the dawn of, of sort of modern technology. And the, um, the Victorian internet, the telegraph system, was impacted by space weather. And so electrical currents were being induced in the copper lines of the telegraph system. So in the, in the United States, for example, the operators between Portland and Oregon could have a, 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 um, a conversation with their, their Morse keys just using the electrical current induced in the lines from the, the, the fluctuating geomagnetic field. So they could disconnect their batteries from the system and continue to operate their electrical circuitry. So that was really the, the, the dawn of space weather in that technological term. Now, in reality, the Earth's been bathed by the solar wind, the material leaving the sun, the sun's magnetic field since it was created but you know those cave people didn't really care they might have seen some lights in the night sky sometimes if they were at mid latitudes that they weren't used to seeing and i'm, I'm pretty sure they had a big effect sort of uh, socially and, and spiritually but but human beings we're pretty we're oblivious to what's going on but actually the technology we've built now that our society relies on that's actually susceptible and sensitive to space weather effects which brings us just some new environmental challenges to deal with all right so sp space weather can actually um what, what's happening in the sun can actually have a detrimental effect on a sort of current technology is that it's like sort of uh, trans right. transmissions That's and right. communications and things yeah totally so so um if you go through the list satellites themselves can be damaged by the increase in the radiation environment we think of the van allen belts as they used to be known the radiation belts that's about the same place as geostationary orbit so a lot of communication satellites are in that part of space where when space weather is really bad and those radiation belts kind of get dialed up to 11 by solar activity, they can have either damage or their lifetime shortened by, by um, space weather effects. And then the signals they send through the Earth to the Earth have to come through the atmosphere and the Earth's ionosphere, which is the electrically charged layer of the Earth's atmosphere, 
um, that becomes more disturbed. So you're trying to send a signal through a disturbed electrically um, charged medium that can disrupt GPS and radio signals or even point to point on the ground, high frequency shortwave radio waves have to bend through the ionosphere that can get disturbed as well so radio communications and down at ground level the the, the rapid fluctuations in the earth's field because basically the earth is being pummeled by the magnetized solar wind that can create very rapidly fluctuating magnetic fields at ground level so if you had a compass out you might see a compass wobbling a bit but in practice what's happening is that fluctuating magnetic field is permeating the surface of the Earth, and the Earth's surface is electrically conductive very slightly. And so if you have a fluctuating magnetic field and a conductor, bingo, you've got a dynamo. You start generating currents. And so electrical currents are trying to flow through the surface of the Earth, which, although it conducts currents, it's not great. Rock's quite a good insulator. But then, of course, us smart human beings have built power grids that span continents with transformers that are Earth to ground. And so the electrical currents can flow through the power grids and go through the transformers and, and can damage transformers as well. So it can unbalance electricity transformers. It can influence the currents flowing through railway lines, which can interrupt with signaling. Um, it, can inter it can flow with currents through uh, pipelines, long gas pipelines, causing them to corrode more quickly. Uh, aircraft radiation doses go up for the crews on aircraft. All these sorts of things start happening. And, it, and, and really, as I say, hundreds of years ago, no one really cared. But of course, nowadays, we rely upon these things. So we have to kind of think about how bad could space weather get? Do we need to worry about it? Can we forecast it? And that's the kind of science that I do. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was going to be my next question. Is, is there anything we can do to, to, to predict when a particularly bad spate of space weather is going to occur? Yeah, so, so space weather forecasting is sort of in its infancy nowadays. Um, so uh, we don't have huge numbers of measurements of the space environment. I mean, we have, we have perhaps a couple of dozen satellites that are making measurements of the sun, solar activity, um, the interplanetary space between the sun and the Earth, and then the region around Earth, the, what we call the geospace environment, the radiation belts, the reason over the poles. So we've got some satellites, but even if you say we have a few dozen doing it, imagine trying to do a global weather forecast with a couple of dozen thermometers around the surface of the Earth. It, it would be really tricky to get a good model going. So we're really playing catch up there. But we are making those measurements. We, we understand roughly what kind of things can, can trigger space weather. So we're looking for active regions on the surface of the sun, which can fire material out in almost any direction. Sometimes they'll head towards the Earth. So we might see something coming with our, our spacecraft observing the sun. Um, crucially, we'd like to be able to understand the magnetic structures within these coronal mass ejections head into the Earth. Um, if we can get that right, we can probably make a reasonably good assessment of how geo-effective it might be. So geo-effective is the word we, we, um, we use to describe just how much impact it's going to have, and that's to do with pretty much the relative orientation of the magnetic structures inside a coronal mass, um, mass ejection and the Earth's magnetic field. Once we do that, we have sensors. Uh, we can have balloon sensors that measure, measure radiation doses in the upper atmosphere. We have ground-based sensors to measure radiation doses on the ground. We have magnetometers, radars to study the motion of the ionosphere and the electrical currents in the ionosphere. So we're getting there. We, we're starting to understand it more and more. And what's emerging is that space weather just needs to be considered as one of those environmental risks we just need to think about. So. Um, about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, most people in Britain probably didn't really care about volcanoes and volcanic ash. And yeah. then in, in 2010, an Icelandic volcano blew its top and we know that had a huge impact on air travel over Europe because of the ash cloud that was put up into the upper atmosphere. And so we can see about these events, which are probably quite seldom and might not be on, on our home turf. We need to understand how those could impact our, our way of life. And so you might think the same about tsunamis or earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, pandemic diseases, all these things we need to think about. S extreme space weather, severe space weather is one of those things that's on the government's list of things that we need to think about and start planning for. And, you know, if the, if the means of... of predicting a particularly bad speed do, do you get to the stage where we can re accurately do that i mean do you think that there's 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 much we can sort of do about it anyway yeah that the, the probably is if you if you're prepared enough you can you can cope with a lot and so a lot of it's about understanding and knowing what's going to happen or or what might happen and then and then having people in the room who, who, who are aware of this so if you took a for example um uh, power grid operations then 
at first you might think that, well, the best thing to do is just turn everything off. But yeah. if you imagine going to say, you know, Mr. President, we need to turn off the power grid because a sort of coronal mass ejection is on the way. And, and our modelling suggests if we do, a few thousand people are probably going to die from, you know, their power going off or something, something bad will happen. And you've got a way against that something happening because the coronal mass ejection might create a big space weather event. You know, which president's going to turn off the power to their country? But in reality, what you probably want to do is turn everything on because the power grids, um, it, they're complex structures, they're networks. And what you ideally want to do is have as many paths for currents to flow through the power grids as possible. And so if, for example, you had some of your lines say, out for maintenance, so there was no power through, you'd probably want to bring them back into service so that any power running through the grid can go through as many paths as possible and diminish the impact. Um, similarly, if you've got a spacecraft in orbit around the Earth and you're a bit worried that um, you might end up with having some strange effects going on, uh, one, one reasonably common phenomenon is something called a single event upset. And that's where a very high energy particle, high energy subatomic electrically charged particle, passes through the semiconductors, the silicon chips, and deposits some electrical charge. Now, of course, silicon chips work in binary. They work in ones and zeros. So dropping a bit of charge into a bit of memory is the equivalent of flicking it from a zero to a one. So you might create a sort of phantom instruction. Now, that phantom instruction would probably be harmless. But if it was something not harmless, like shut off all systems or point your solar panels away from the sun, that could really damage a spacecraft. So you might put a, might put a satellite into a safe mode of operations, shut down the non-essential functions, not do any maintenance and say, for the next 24 hours, you know, go into safe mode, don't do anything crazy, yeah. and then we'll talk to you again in 24 hours. You might put your astronauts in a, in a safer part of the International Space Station where the walls are a bit thicker and you've got a bit more shielding. You, if you've got a crew on the way to Mars, again, you might have a refuge on the spacecraft where they can go and hunker down if, 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 a, if a coronal mass ejection is on the way. So, so planning gives you, gives you, you know, some time, gives you some opportunities to plan. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I was, I was also thinking about is the fact that um, we have this continual human presence in, in Earth orbit and in the form of the, the space station. Um, there must be a degree of, you know, having to plan, for example, spacewalks around whether or not you think that there's going to be exactly, p particularly yeah. bad... Um, yeah, so you'd probably avoid a spacewalk if you, had, if you knew there was space weather was going to be bad. So in low Earth orbit, it's not so bad because the Earth's magnetic field... Um, is a marvellous thing. Um, imagine uh, you've got, you know, you've got uh, the Starship Enterprise up shields. The, 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 the sun, uh, sorry, the Earth's magnetic field gives us a force field around the planet, and it's kind of a two-phase thing. So that force, that that magnetic force field, actually deflects most of the solar wind around the planet because the solar wind is comprised of uh, ionised gas coming from the solar surface. It's mainly ionised hydrogen which basically is protons and electrons, and ionised helium. So you'd end up with what we call alpha particles and electrons. Um, but because they're electrically charged, they, they, they are sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field, and they divert around the planet mainly. Uh, so the, the Earth's magnetic field sort of acts like a, a rock in a river. Everything flows around us. And that's, that then protects our atmosphere, and the atmosphere is really great at absorbing radiation. So the harmful x-rays, ultraviolet light, that gets absorbed by the atmosphere. So here at ground level, we're, we're all good. Um, and in low Earth orbit, although you're above the atmosphere, you are still quite deep within the Earth's magnetosphere, the, air, the sphere of influence of the Earth's magnetic field. And so we get a load of shielding. So, so the International Space Station's reasonably well shielded, um, naturally by the Earth. And of course, there are areas, I understand, that, that if things are thought to be particularly hazardous or, or if the, the uh, ISS is going to fly through some of the naturally occurring slightly weak spots in the Earth's field, then you can basically get the crew to go to one part of the spacecraft or you know, not do a spacewalk or something like that. But there's some really interesting stuff about interplanetary travel. So I, I, what we now know, looking back, and it's kind of terrifying, is that during the Apollo era, um, there were several uh, what we call solar energetic particle outbursts. This is sort of the sun just belching out a load of relativistic, so, so particles moving at the speed of light, subatomic particles. And these would be quite dangerous. Um, and, and again, if you plot out the timeline, you can plot a chart and you can show where all the Apollo missions were going to the moon. And then you were looking back, we can see where all these solar energetic proton events, or sorry, solar energetic particle events were, and they interleave. So, so the Apollo missions, which were lasting for about a week by the time you've flown to the moon, looked around on the moon and come back again, they just happened to miss them all. And that was great. And most of them would have been okay. A couple of them would have given a 
higher than radiation dose than you'd really like. And there was at least one where the radiation dose probably would have just killed the crew within hours. You know, so, so they wouldn't have done a Tom Hanks. They wouldn't have done Apollo 13. They wouldn't have come back. They would have been killed in orbit. But we just managed to miss them. But... But they didn't know that at the time? They didn't know that at the time. But So now we know that. And of course, if you think about that, you know, if you think about um, uh, the Apollo missions over, you know, say three years, there were a few of these events, but the week-long missions avoid them all. If you're going to Mars, you're going to suck up all of those because your flight's going to be six to eight months. So we've got to think about how we build spacecraft that can protect astronauts from those kind of events. And also, on your way to Mars, you're outside the Earth's magnetic field for most of the trip. I mean, even going to the moon, if you time it right, the moon is in the Earth's magnetosphere, the, the tail end of the Earth's magnetic field. So, so yeah, these, these Mars missions, you've got the flight to Mars, and then once you're on Mars... Um, Mars is actually a really great analogue for the Earth in terms of space weather, sort of alternative histories. So uh, the Earth has a great double layer defence field. We've got the Earth's magnetic field that shields the atmosphere from, from, space, from uh, a lot of space weather effects. And then the atmosphere absorbs up, soaks up all the radiation. Well, Mars has a really weak magnetic field because deep within its core the uh, churning nickel-iron metal core like we have in the Earth, which is still molten. And Mars, it's frozen solid. It, Mars is just smaller than the Earth. It's about half the size in terms of diameter. So it's just cooled down a lot quicker. And the, it's got a solid core now, which is not churning around. It's not moving. It's not generating a magnetic field. So Mars lost its, sort of inter, its planetary defense shield probably about a billion years after the planet was formed. And ever since then, the solar wind has been able to get access to the atmosphere and just erode it off into space. So it's just carried away. All the water's gone. All the heavy, a lot of the, 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 the volatiles are gone. So basically, you're left with this cold, dry, very thin atmosphere. And that means the radiation can get all the way down to the surface. So Mars, in terms of a habitable environment, space weather has really, has really ruined Mars because it's lost that, that churning dynamo action of a, a, a hot metallic core. So there's really interesting analogues. So when the astronauts get to Mars, we're also going to have to figure out how do they survive there for six months or a year? Are they going to have to basically you know, bulldoze out a trench and put their, their base underground and cover it with the Martian regolith? Will that help them? You know, heavy spacecraft with lots of shielding are tricky. Um, you probably would want to use your water tanks to give you some shielding. You're going to have to take water anyway, so why not keep it in places where it gives you some shielding? So there's all these things we've got to think about to keep our astronauts safe from space weather. Absolutely. It's, it's mind-blowing, isn't it, when you think, like, you know, the uh, difficulties of actually, you know, the, the, the uh, physics of and the engineering of getting humans to Mars. But then once they get there, I mean, yeah. it's just not a nice, <laughs> not a nice place to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of, it, it's a no-fun place and there's yeah. no atmosphere, yeah. Um, but, I mean, y y you touched upon, uh, at the start of this interview, you touched upon uh, there is a, a nice product of space weather and its interaction with Earth, and that's, that's the aurora, isn't it? That's, isn't, that's, that's, that's what causes the aurora? That's what causes the aurora. So we have the aurora borealis, the northern lights, and the aurora australis, the southern lights. Um, and, and obviously those have been around since the formation of the planet, basically. So looking back throughout human history, you can see these great stories of the human beings who tended to be in the northern hemisphere, just, just because of where the land masses are, would see the northern lights and have built them into their, into their folklore and into their legends. Uh, you know, so these are the spirits of those who've gone into the afterlife or you know, it's, 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 the, it's the souls of departed warriors continuing the sort of epic struggle of battle in the afterlife. Or, you know, and, you know, so you know, it's just part of the fabric of society and folklore and, and, and religion in, in some parts of the world. But yeah, the space weather is, is what's generating the northern lights. So um, what's in effect happening is there is a magnetic connection between the, um, the solar wind, which is it was magnetized, it brings the sun's magnetic field out into the solar system. We call it the interplanetary magnetic field. That hooks into the Earth's magnetic field and it actually sets up a convection, a motion in the Earth's magnetic field, which churns up particles. And so this, this connection basically means we live at the heart of a big particle accelerator, <laughs> which is firing material down into the upper atmosphere from the space environment. And when it runs into the upper atmosphere, it causes the, the gas in the atmosphere to glow. So mainly atomic oxygen gives those amazing green and red colors in the same way that a, a neon lamp works. Um, and of course, we just sit here beneath it. It's 100 to 200 kilometers above our head, and you can see these amazing lights in the night sky. So, yeah, space weather, nothing new about it at all. It gives us one of the most amazing natural phenomena that's on a lot of people's bucket lists. You know, I'm pretty sure there's a booming travel industry taking people to see the northern lights. But we've also built ourselves a society where we've just got to keep an eye on it for some other reasons as well. Yeah. Now, that, yeah, 
coming coming back to the dangers, that's one of the things you're talking about um, here at Blue Dot, isn't you? But you're, you're sort of exploring how um, solar flares and and you know that sort of uh, almost like disaster cinema, how, how, how it's portrayed in, in popular culture? That's right, that's right. So there's, there's a few films. So obviously, yeah, disaster cinema is great. You know, there's a lot of natural effects, uh, natural um, uh, uh, disasters that, that Hollywood producers and script writers really like to hook onto. And obviously, meteorites hitting the Earth is the big one. Loads of, loads of movies about that. But also, you've got extreme climate change, you've got uh, tornadoes, you've got flooding, you, you, all this sort of stuff. But there's actually a few that are built around space weather. Um, and so I thought it'd be really fun to explore how those sort of things come into the movie. And, and, and with most Hollywood stuff, I mean, let's, you know, it's no good being snobbish about it. These films are meant to entertain us. They, they are not textbooks and that's great but they usually have a kernel of truth in them somewhere and then that's been extrapolated onwards so if we think about the earth's core and how that's that's basically generates a very strong magnetic field that shields us from space weather and how if we look at mars that process has died away and we've got a very different environment so there was a 2003 movie called the core which is about the earth's core stopping moving I have to say, it is one of the worst films made in human history. <laughs> Nothing to do with the space weather. It's just awful. But there's some really interesting things. So in the beginning of that movie, to set the scene, they have some interesting effects going on, which kind of lend a little bit to reality. So there's a scene, almost like an Alfred Hitchcock scene from The Birds in Trafalgar Square, where the pigeons all seem to go completely crazy and they're flying into vehicles and people and smashing glass windows and terrifying you know, scene. And the idea there is that the Earth's magnetic field is collapsing and these birds that use magnetic fields to navigate are becoming disoriented and panicked. And there is actually research going on that shows how migratory birds are using magnetic fields. It's not a very well understood process. And, uh, and, and actually, you know, the really good competition um, pigeon racers, a lot of them look at space weather forecasts and don't let their birds go when there's geomagnetic stimulus because the birds get lost. They, they, you know, they don't like it or they, they, they get delayed coming home. And so, you know, there are those little elements of truth in there. Um, there are some other pretty wacky things in that particular film. Um, a, a patch of the atmosphere seems to open up with letting microwaves in, which melts the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, you've got to have an iconic US landmark getting destroyed in, in all disaster movies. It, it's, it's rule number one. Um, and, of course, they assemble a crew. There's a scientist who wears corduroy who ends up going on a mission in a sort of tunnelling vehicle to the core of the Earth to restart it with an, with an atomic bomb, you know. As you do, um, but you know, but there are those kernels of truth in there. You know, if, if the course stopped tomorrow, that would be interesting. And what we now know is we can look at the, the the geologic record, and we know that the Earth's core isn't static. We know that on average, every eight hundred thousand years, sorry, every four hundred thousand years or so, the core the, the, the field reverses. And so actually the field seems to die away and then re-emerge in the opposite configuration. So the the north and south poles reverse. And you sit and think, gosh, well, that, what would we do? What would space weather be like if that happened tomorrow? And it's, it's a really good question. This reversal probably takes, well, 10,000 years-ish. So it's quite gradual. So the idea that suddenly one Tuesday afternoon, the pigeons in Trafalgar Square are going to go completely bonkers is probably not going to happen because in reality, there are many thousands of generations of pigeons that would evolve over this change of the Earth's field. But, uh, but you know, we, we know this stuff happens. We can look at the Earth's surface and the magnet magnetization patterns. So there's some, there's some great stuff, and it's just a great, fun way of exploring space weather and, and how the science works. Um, what do you think is missing from our knowledge of space weather? Because one of the things I was going to ask you was, you know, if, if you sort of money were, no, money were no object and you could design and, and brief your own mission, like the Parker Solar Probe, to study the sun, study space weather, mm -hmm. what would it be? What's... What, what, okay, what's, that's a good what's, question. What's missing from our knowledge? So I think I think if money was no object, I think I'd launch two two spacecraft missions. And the first one, I think what I'd try and do is have a string of of almost like um, in the ocean when you have uh, weather sensing meteorological buoys uh, or buoys as our, our transatlantic colleagues call them. You know, you can see weather fronts moving across the ocean. Now in space, to get something on a direct line between the Earth and the Sun. It's probably quite tricky because things tend to orbit the sun, so they don't stay still. But you really want a load of stuff between the sun and the Earth. Um, so actually, I'd love to have a whole flotilla of spacecraft in orbit around the sun at different distances, such that at any one time there's a string of spacecraft. Now, we can do some of this remote sensing-wise. We can do some of this from the side. If you have a spacecraft imaging the Earth-Sun firing line from the side, you can see things coming through space. And there are missions proposed that will do that. 
the challenge there is though that those will see structures coming but what you want to really do is measure them as they wash over a spacecraft so you get what we call an in situ measurement so you can sense the magnetic structures as they go over and really you need to be inside the event for do that to do that well so I think I'd do that, but that would probably require a few dozen spacecraft in various solar orbits, so it's going to take a really big pools win. And then the other one I think I'd like to do would be have several spacecraft in Earth orbit dedicated to real-time monitoring of the northern lights. So you can look down on the northern lights from above, and when you do that, you get this amazing vantage point. You realise it's not just sort of some lights in the sky above you. You realise there's a crown-like oval surrounding the magnetic pole that grows and shrinks, it expands and contracts and it brightens up and structures move around. Um, and the trouble is, is to observe those well, you need, tend to not want to be too far away from the Earth and it's very difficult to put things well. It's impossible to put something in geostationary orbit above the pole, so you'd probably want several missions that are constantly going over the polar region, handing off from one to the next, looking down with images, beaming that back to Earth in real time so we can monitor the, the effect of space weather. So in effect, I, I think my wish list would include a network of spacecraft that are going to see stuff coming, and then a network of spacecraft that can give us real-time sort of now casting, monitoring. You do see the, those um, images of uh, the Northern Lights that have been captured by astronauts on the International right. Space Station. Yeah. So um, would it be sort of similar to that? Could, could, could you effectively put, put an instrument on the, on the ISS that would at least give you some of that information? Yeah, you, you could do. And, uh, so there's a lot of cameras in low Earth orbit that do bits and pieces here and there. The, the trouble is, is they tend to be orbiting the Earth every 90 minutes or so. Um, and so they go over the, the northern lights quite rapidly. Um, and also, most of those spacecraft are in, in inclined orbit. So a geostationary satellite will orbit basically in the equatorial plane, and a polar satellite will orbit over the poles. Um, polar orbits are, are um, not quite as common for some of these, these kind of orbiting, especially the ISS. It's, it's not going over the polar regions as much, so you kind of see the northern lights slightly side on. Uh, but yeah, you can do it from low Earth orbit. So if we could piggyback on lots of those missions, perhaps that's the way ahead. Yeah, that, that, I mean, the, uh, the notion of the, uh, the polar, polar orbit, that reminds me of the uh, Juno mission at Jupiter, because that was a polar orbit as well. And, that's and, right, yeah. And it was able to... Yeah, it, it, it's been able to detect some of Jupiter's aurora, hasn't that's it? That's right. That's right. So that's right. So you can fly in a, in a polar orbit, and every orbit you go over the polar regions, and you can you can see the northern lights, um, and so you get these amazing views looking down. And, and and what you can also do if your spacecraft has got particle detectors and field detectors, you actually fly through the regions where all these energetic particles are streaming down into the upper atmosphere, and the electrical currents. If you imagine electrons moving downwards. High school physics tells us that's a current moving upwards. So actually you're flying through electrical currents and you can measure those and sense them. So that's that's really great to be able to do. Um, the, the annoying thing is, is for something like, I mean, if I was if it was my wish list, I'd have five or six Juno spacecraft in, a, in an orbit following each other. So you've always got some over the pole because nature likes to play tricks on us. And normally the really interesting stuff just really kicks off just as your spacecraft <laughs> is disappearing off over the horizon. It's it's to keep us all in jobs, so it's good. I think you make a good pitch. I, 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 I think you should, you should uh, pitch this mission to the, 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 the European yeah. pitches. I'll, I'll pitch it to East to see what they come yeah. up with. I'll buy a Euro Millions ticket as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, Jim, thanks very much for sitting down and chatting to me today. And, You're very um, welcome. You know, enjoy the rest of the festival. It's been amazing hearing about this and space weather and Aurora and all the disaster cinema as, as, as we've been discussing um, but yeah um, good, good luck with your talk and enjoy the rest of the festival thanks you too brilliant